Andy, I hold the Schreier chair here at CSIS, and uh, we're having a conversation about front and center in the policy agenda is leveling the playing field for American businesses, making it possible for American companies to both comply with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and join us in every corner and every stretch of the globe. Removing impediments for American businesses is one of the things I think we should be doing. Why? I'm a bit of an evangelist on this. Yes, we hear the headlines sometimes about an American company that didn't do the right thing. But what you see when you spend your life overseas like I do is the amazing transformational impact of having American businesses alongside you. I have seen first power, firsthand the power of American business to transform a country, to demonstrate what it looks like to do business transparently, accountability, without paying bribes, Every time an American company does that successfully overseas, it squeezes the room for corruption and pushes it back in the corner in the hole it should belong in. I've seen the power of American businesses to serve as an engine of opportunity. It's like one of the best brand uh, campaigns we could do for what America's all about. I've seen them hire based on drive and skill and know-how, not on the right family name. And I've seen people be advanced on merit and hard work rather than on family connections. It's the American dream exported abroad. And I've seen American companies solve unbelievably complex problems and manage unbelievably complex projects. Um, if if you want to, in the q and I'll talk to you about the Panama Canal bid and about the London Olympic Village brought to you by great American companies demonstrating the very best of our know-how. When great American companies gain a foothold, sometimes they do that with the help of an embassy to lay the groundwork for them, what happens is they can transform the environment for the better. They advance our development goals tremendously. They advance our counterterrorism goals. They advance our national security goals. And they do wonders for America's image, for our soft power, for our approval rating, which is perhaps the best coin for any American ambassador you want a strong proof, approval rating. I'm going to skip my five or six examples, because I think Dan's going to come to those later, of what we can do. But I'm just going to end with this image. When I started my career, I worked in Latin America, which we spent a good bit of time talking about at lunch. And we had these maps all over our embassies, and they were of, uh, in two colors, green, brown, and Panama was gray, for reasons we can discuss, that's where I was. The green countries were ones where the democracy agenda had taken hold, where military dictatorships had been replaced by democratically elected governments. And our job was to turn that entire map green, to bring democratically elected governments. It was a massively empowering kind of vision. Um, it, gave, it was clear, we knew what hill we were supposed to take, and we poured our hearts and souls into it. It really resonated for us. So when I got to London at the, my last overseas posting and the companies I was working with, American companies who had their EMEA, Europe, Middle East, and Africa practices headquartered in London, told me about the maps they had on their walls, I was a little horrified because they had big maps of continents, including Africa, with countries grayed out as places we can't do business. It's too corrupt. We can't pay the bribes. Our contracts are unenforceable. Don't even go there. Don't even think about it. Seed the field. This strikes me as a really, really bad geostrategic space for, Amer for the world's global leader to be in. We want to reverse that. So what I want is a new mission. I want a new charge, and I want business and, and other thinkers that are here to create a demand signal for foreign service officers to get out there and shrink that gray space. Gray space. Grow a map where American companies can compete on a level playing field, and then they can operate effectively, and then they can burnish our brand and remind the world why America is the indispensable business partner. There we are. Thanks, Ambassador Stevenson. Okay, Laura Lane, you're the president of Global Affairs at UPS. You've had several really interesting past lives. Mm -hmm. You were you had a, a similar a, a very senior level role at Citigroup, mm -hmm. and then you were also at Time Warner. Mm -hmm. But you also were a Foreign Service officer. So what do you think about this? 
Well, having been an econ officer myself, um, I, I believe in everything that uh, Ambassador Stevenson is calling for because I know the critical importance of the Foreign Service in the, as a front line of advocacy, not just for business, but for that rule of law that allows business to grow in any given market. Um, we are big believers that where democracy flourishes, there's opportunity, economic opportunities. And now serving in this uh, senior role at UPS, we decide which markets we go into to based on you know the uh, the rule of law that exists in those markets and so couldn't agree more in that the embassies have been our partners in every market that we've gone into just by quick background UPS um, delivers in 220 countries and territories and um, we uh, carry three percent of global GDP we'd love for that number to be bigger um, and at, at times we can only cross the border and hand it off because there are some concerns about that that last mile delivery and the kind of requirements that um, would be needed to deliver that time definite um, package, um, given that there isn't a clear uh, understanding of what the rules are, what the requirements are, and sometimes that there are expectations about uh, facilitating payments, which we as a company, first and foremost, not just because of the law, but because of the integrity that is so central to who, uh, who we are as UPSers, um, keeps us from going into markets. Markets. We'd love for that whole map, I'd say maybe not green, I'd say all brown, um, in that we want it to be <laughs> we want it to be places where UPS can deliver everywhere end to end. Um, but then again, at the borders is where we see the biggest challenges because that's where corruption thrives in so many countries. If we can address those fundamental issues of corruption at the borders, I think we could have a tremendous impact in terms of growing exports as well as foreign investment. What greater partners could we have than an embassy, foreign commercial service officers and foreign econ officers by our sides championing the importance of that kind of clear process starting at the border and continuing on into the country. So from that perspective, from my experience as an econ officer, I know the role that foreign service officers can play. Um, from the perspective now within business, I know that partnership is essential because together I think that is the secret uh, to how we can grow American business opportunities, not just exports, but investments around the world. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. so. Kendra, you're the Senior Policy Director of the America's Program at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, but you wear another hat. You're that you manage the Chamber's Coalition for the Rule of Law and Global Markets. And you also had a past life at the State Department. You're a, you're a former career diplomat and civil servant. So what do you think about this? Well, it seems like we all have a lot of past lives here, but the good news about uh, previous iterations is that it gives you great experience from, from which to look at an issue and bring a lot of uh, expertise to bear. And so I'm very proud to, to serve in those two capacities that Dan mentioned um, in our Americas uh, team for our international division of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We're focused on uh, hemispheric growth and opportunities, particularly for American business, and uh, as the head of our Coalition for the Rule of Law and Global Markets. And one of the reasons why we have this coalition is because our president and CEO, Tom Donahue, is very uh, frequently reminding um, our, our American business and our global community that 95% of the world's consumers are outside of the United States. So that means for American business, for American companies who want to grow and compete and thrive, they're looking at markets beyond the United States border. And so for companies who are looking at those opportunities, they're really looking at some key criteria. They're looking at market opportunity, market access, and then they're looking at the rule of law. And I know that this is a conversation about corruption, but our, the reason that our coalition is focused on the rule of law is because we see corruption as really a symptom of a broader concept. And so we focus through the work of our members in highlighting these issues, collaborating with the State Department and with uh, the various ag agencies across U.S. government to really uh, emphasize why this is a priority for the business community. We work with partners um, in governments around the world, particularly through our American Chambers of Commerce. And specifically, there's an intersection in our work, um, my work, my two hats, um, in the Americas and in our rule of law work, and that it was our American Chambers of Commerce in Latin America and the Caribbean, which have an association called ACLA, where in an annual survey, they identified the challenges of rule of law as being the number one 
persistent issue that American business was facing when uh, seeking to compete for opportunities in markets across the region. And so through ACLA and through that impetus of collaboration with our AmCHAMs, we launched this coalition and a dashboard that measures the challenges that American businesses face in the market. But more importantly, we're, we're delighted to be able to talk about this and, and really welcome the signals from Ambassador Stevenson about the engagement of the Foreign Service uh, on this issue because we think it really is about having a positive conversation with partners, partners here in the US government about why this is important for the American business and how we can work together to elevate these concerns as we uh, work with our global partners around the world. And also in partnering because often when we are uh, traveling around the world with delegations as incoming governments come to visit us at the chamber, they're looking to encourage and attract greater US investment in their markets to help grow their own uh, economic opportunities within their own countries. And in so doing, they want to see the US be a key player in that. And so we have the opportunity through a spirit of collaboration and an opportunity to encourage governments to look at the rule of law, look at the institutions that they have in place that allow for business to thrive and to be able to have a positive conversation about those things that governments can focus on to help uh, grow the pie in their own countries, which also helps American business to be able to compete better um, within uh, the rules of the road. Okay, so Kendra, do a one minute infomercial about <laughs> unlocking growth and prosperity, because I think it's a very interesting product. Absolutely. As I alluded to, and thank you for the, the, the lead in to the infomercial, we have a report that we produce that's uh, adequately titled Unlocking Growth and Prosperity. It is uh, most recently published in December 2017, but it's something that we started working on and publishing 20, in 2013 that looks at um, the rule of law and how it is respected, specifically with a focus on those indicators and those topics that are important to business. And so those five areas are transparency, accountability, stability, predictability, and due process. Those are key criteria in that companies are looking at when they're going to do business in a market. And so when those governments come to us or when our AmCHAMs are meeting uh, with their host governments and talking about opportunities uh, to attract American business to their markets, we can point to the opportunity to increase prosperity in those markets by focusing on these key institutional areas. Great. Thank you. Okay. Nancy Boswell, you're director of the Anti-Corruption Law Certificate Program at American University, but you're really well known in Washington for having been the president and CEO of Transparency International USA from its founding in 1994 to 2011. You, had, you were a lawyer at one part, point in your life. You were a banker at one point in your life. Anyways, but, 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 you are, but you are someone that when I think about anti-corruption efforts in town, you're a, you're a top of mind for me. So is this what Ambassador Stevenson and the other folks put on the table, is this, is this realistic? And if it was realistic, what would be the sorts of things you'd want to see? Thank you for including me, uh, because I do think it's, it's an important discussion. And uh, it has been a long time that, that we've all been working on this. And many people I see sitting out in, in, uh, in our audience today have been working on it longer than I have, if that's, if that's possible. Um, I mean, first and foremost, uh, I think there's a synergy here between what's in the interest of ethical American business and what's in the interest of the people of the countries where American business operates. I think sometimes uh, the sort of um, level the playing field America, American business uh, championing their interests doesn't go over terribly well. Uh, in countries that are struggling with corruption themselves. The citizens of those countries equally suffer when procurement, let's say, public contracting uh, runs amok. So there's $10 trillion in public contracting. American business, if they can't pay bribes, is going to lose huge opportunities uh, for contracts and therefore uh, jobs, job creation here. But on the receiving end of that are a lot of citizens who need those public services. And the statistics around uh, the impact on the people of the country in terms of denial of health care, of education, of clean water, uh, are, are simply staggering. I put some numbers down, but I won't, uh, won't throw them out for the moment. Let's just say they're, they're really um, a great incentive for doing this work on anti-corruption. So, uh, I think that synergy between what's good for American business and what's good for the people that 
um, our embassies are out there working with is one that we should, we should bear in mind. Um, the other point I'd make is that U.S. leadership has been really important for as long as I've worked on this. Uh, and American business has played a, a key role in making sure that the American government was working on it. Uh, so we're, we're, I don't know if we're full circle or mid-battle, but I tend to say we're mid-battle. We're, 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 if one of the issues was leveling the playing field, uh, we are halfway there. We have a lot of conventions today from the OECD convention prohibiting foreign bribery to a lot of legal agreements that look at the preventive side, that look at rule of law, uh, conflicts of interest, transparency, accountability, and so forth. So we have all these commitments out there, but nowhere near the kind of enforcement uh, that we need. So to me, uh, there's a very strong business case to stay, in the, stay on the field, uh, remain engaged to re-energize the State Department. Um, where the leadership is critical, and to infuse this. I mean, it's not a separate issue. Um, corruption is not over here, and then there's agriculture or uh, human rights or development or something. Corruption runs through everything, and I think um, reigniting that commitment at the top uh, and down throughout the service through USAID and so forth um, is, is very timely. Okay, so, but let me just, just I want to take advantage yeah. of the fact that you're with us, Nancy. So yeah. if you had a, if you were uh, in a meeting with the Secretary of State or you were in a meeting with the Secretary of Commerce, in terms of steps that were possible, that were realistic, okay. what would be a set of two or three realistic things the United States could be doing given the cards that we, we've got in our hands right now? Well, you, you uh, in our pre, in our prep for this, you told me five or six, so I have quite a. <laughs> I'm, I'm, quite I'm, happy, a I'll, I'm happy to take five or six, but if you I'm had to just tell me what would be what so would be your. We add to that yeah, yeah, we're going to come back. We're going to. I wanted Nancy to start this off. Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, we do. Let's go back to the. Con we do have all these conventions, and there's no mechanism to make them work. And I think everybody's beginning to look from the OECD working group on bribery to the OAS with their convention to UNCAC, how do we move countries who have been told, here are the vulnerabilities, the deficiencies, you need to take action, but they're not doing it. So I think some rethinking of um, name and shame penalties, something that moves us forward. Similarly, the World Bank, the investigations unit, INT, and the IDB and so forth have done an amazing job um, pursuing allegations against companies and sanctioning uh, companies found to have engaged in, in bad practices, but they also refer the cases to the governments where the public official is. And those referrals go nowhere. So something more needs, needs to be done there and needs to be done across the what we call the demand side. I mean, we can't just attack companies for doing the wrong thing. We have to um, work more on uh, both sides of the equation. Uh, from my own perspective, training. There's just a vast need for more training. Even where political will is there, people don't have the skills. So the work that the Center for International Private Enterprise is doing or that the State Department is doing, we're doing at American University at the law school, I think needs to be ramped up to, to a whole nother level. I would add, um, I don't know if this is the right time, but go ahead. add it anyway. Um, we need to restore our own credibility. I think our credibility to lead on this topic abroad um, is, is compromised at best. I mean, I picked up yesterday's paper to see Rex Tillerson saying that there's an ethics crisis infecting the U.S. That's pretty, pretty strong language. So for us to uh, go abroad, I think we need to start looking at those things. One thing is on beneficial ownership, uh, transparency. There's been legislation on the Hill. Uh, through multiple administrations, and it's never passed. It seems to have an, uh, a chance this year, to your point about realistic. I think it could pass. I think we should rejoin the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. Uh, it's not the be-all, end-all, but it's an important tool in our toolbox uh, to get transparency into extractive payments. Um, and then, of course, in terms of our own uh, ethics and conflicts of interest and respect for our own rules, um, the Office of Government Ethics uh, has been widely ignored. 
Uh, I think we need to look at how do we strengthen that office and how do we look at the deficiencies that have been identified. Maybe it's not in the letter of the law, but it certainly is in the spirit of the law. How do we, um, how do we promote more, more respect in our own administration for, for both the spirit and the letter of the law? Thank you. Very well put. Thank you, Nancy. Let me just uh, push the button on the uh, microphone, if you would, please. Okay. So, thank you. Steve Zimmerman. Okay. So, you're a senior advisor, your governance global practice at the World Bank. You were at the Inter-American Development Bank doing similar work. You've also been a prosecutor uh, in, with the Depart U.S. Department of Justice. So, um, can you talk a little bit about the kinds of asks that you're getting from client countries. Is there is there is this a growth industry, the anti-corruption business? Is that a growth industry? Well, I'm certainly relatively convinced it's a there's enough of a growth to keep me employed until I need to retire. Um, you know, um, I corruption has been around uh, about as long, a very long time. Uh, one of uh, colleagues at lunch made the point that we've been at the sort of technical assistance side for about 35 years, you know, and I think that's a question that comes up often at the World Bank. I, I, I was not at the State Department, but uh, certainly have been involved in this kind of work for some time. And at the, at the bank, we often ask, like, well, how much progress have we made in Africa? We've poured a lot of money into economic development in Africa. Where, where are we making progress? One of the challenges with corruption, actually, I think that we're facing at the World Bank is actually even that. How do we measure what kind of progress we're making and what is it that's really leading to the progress that we're making. Last year, the bank put out a publication called the World Development Report, um, which is a fascinating document if you've got a, some time to sit down and read. But the, the fundamental point that it made is that technical assistance, uh, training prosecutors, and enforcement, even though I might back So was it on governance? Was the WDR yeah, last WDR year? So on once governance. a year, the World Bank does a big, deep dive study that takes two years, and they get every smart person in the world around the table and they write a big 300-page report on a topic. Right. And so last year, pictures. the topic was governance, right. right? Yeah, so it's a bit of a read. But the, the, yeah. the main In your spare time. In your spare it's time. Your spare here's lots of it. The fundamental point that I wanted to focus on, though, is that it really concludes at the end of the day, uh, you cannot, you will not change the paradigm on corruption until you change the political asymmetries, until you really address the political problem, until you address the trust problem. Um, so. And that is really where the bank is now trying to put its focus and create demand. You know, you say, is there demand? It's always a difficult question. There are not that many governments that come in and say, please help us find corruption in our government. Um, and that's true around the world, regardless of the economic situation. So the challenge at the bank is to try and find a way to create that demand and to demonstrate why it should be there. We do, get, we do have demand for technical assistance, and we work with the State Department and the other governments. We, we do get demand for putting in place different types of programs. And it is, it's fairly substantial. But what we're really trying to do now is find other entree points to address the problem as a development challenge and get countries to look in the longer view. I think one of the challenges, and this is certainly true in the United States, as in, true in any country, is politics is very short term. Uh, and so we're looking for longer term. This is a long term problem that demands long term solutions. So the big challenge is finding the willingness and the demand and the patience to be persistent uh, and look in the longer term and look at long term, long term actions. Could you just spend a minute on one or two happy stories in terms of the kinds of stuff you've either done at the IDB or at the World Bank where there's actually been a problem and it's been fixed? Could you just Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so one area of great emphasis now at the World Bank is how can we use technology? Um, and when I say technology, I do not mean Bitcoin. Um, uh, everyone thinks that, you know, Bitcoin is the solution to, to all ills. But let me give you an example of how we're using technology to address um, fraud and corruption linked to such. Uh, we have a program in, uh, two programs involving biometrics. In Guinea, in the country of Guinea, uh, we introduced biometrics that allow government officials to determine absenteeism in government. And they were able to identify 10% of the public employees who were not actually working that were saved about $2 million a month, which in Guinea is, is real money. Uh, in India, we had a similar program for teachers, where we were able to use biometrics to identify 
uh, absenteeism. Essentially, my, my family's actually from Argentina, and so the, the, the word for this is called gnocchi, because gnocchi is the food you eat on payday. Uh, and you, everybody went out and got gnocchis because you didn't work all, all month, but you got paid once a month, and you went and had gnocchis. So the people who didn't work were called gnocchis. Uh, and so this is a, an, an example of how we're linking technology to deal with a very pragmatic problem that goes to the revenue of the country. Because one of the big challenges of corruption in the developing world is it saps away domestic revenue, which means the money coming from the State Department or AID, it doesn't necessarily just go to, to adding to the revenues. You're, you're supplanting, you're replacing the money that's lost to corruption. So those are two examples where we actually use technology to help with the budget, but specifically on, to address fraud uh, not as directly connected to corruption, but still an example of how we would use those those products. Yeah, let me just let me just push Stephen just a little bit further. Though. Okay, so how much of this is a if I say that there's there's a cultural component to corruption? What's your response to that? The first thing. No. The se no. Okay. Second. second question. Thank you. Thank you for your brevity. Second is second is uh, if the U.S. said they wanted to get at the front of the parade on anti-corruption, what's your reaction to that? Don't. They should not get to the front of the parade. They should not get to the front of the parade, and why not? That, this is the answer I gave 15 years ago. It has nothing to do with the current, current political situation on which I have, uh, will not comment. No, 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 but the, the reason is this. Corruption, the U.S., for the last 20, 30, forever, as long as this, in modern political times, meaning the last 20 or 30 years, the U.S. has been at the forefront of this issue. The FCPA. Uh, the, the way GOJ, OECD, yeah, OECD, even pushing the OECD. The OECD is essentially, you know, coming on the heels. The, exactly, Jim Wolfenson and his speech. The U.S. has always been the one pushing this agenda, pushing the rock up the hill. Yeah. Um, that got to a point 10 years ago, I think, where a lot of the rest of the world got a little tired of the U.S. always singing the anti-corruption song, and they felt like, uh, this is from my experience at the IDB, there was a perception that it was a U.S.-driven initiative. And my advice then, and would be now, is the strength of the U.S. in this case is to lead from behind. You know, set aside current political situations. The, the, the rest of the world needs to step up. And when I say, and we start with the G7, and then you move into the G20, and we talk about, you know, I'm skipping ahead to suggestions, I suppose, but I think, in the context of the G20, I represent the World Bank at the G20 and the anti-corruption working group at the G20. Uh, and I have conversations with the US delegation, which have not changed over the last 10 years. Uh, they're the bank. That's an opportunity for the, for the US to push the rest of the G20 in particular areas and, and lead from behind. They don't have to be in front of this issue, but they need to make sure that there are other champions for the issue. Okay, thank you. Laura. Please. So three comments. First, picking up on Stevens. Um, the idea of leveraging technology is key. And think about it at the border. The one thing that the US government could do is uh, ensure the effective implementation of the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement. You know okay, what that is? Yeah, explain what that is. OK, the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement is the effort to put in place rules um, for customs. And one of the principal fundamental aspects of it is to take take technology and turn customs processes electronic. You know why that's key? Bitstreams don't ask for bribes. And that's how you start tra transforming borders um, in terms of creating those processes that make it automatic for goods to move across the border. Why is that important? You start setting up those examples of the countries that have set up the right kind of processes, and then you can point to them as the power of positive in which that kind of customs modernization facilitates economic development. The third point I want to make is I'll give you a very concrete example, and it's one that's very personal to me. I served at the American Embassy in Kigali, Rwanda during the genocide. Talk about the collapse of the rule of law. I witnessed that firsthand. Fast forward uh, almost 24 years later, I returned to Kigali, Rwanda as a representative of UPS to launch, ready for this, the very first drone service anywhere in the world, a commercial drone service for the delivery of blood and medical supplies. And you know why that transformation happened? 
because Paul Kagame recognized that the collapse of rule of law, which uh, was a large part among many other factors for the genocide, needed to be rectified. He put in place a regulatory framework that allowed us to approach him and said, listen, we're going to be bringing some innovation, i.e. drone technology that's never been used in a commercial way anywhere in the world. We need our intellectual property protected. We need those medical supplies crossing the border and coming in so that we can make sure we deliver to any clinic 15 minutes or less anywhere around the country. Uh, uh, General Kagame now, President Kagame said, you have my commitment, got the whole, all of the uh, affected ministries involved, and you know what? We're doing 40,000 drone uh, deliveries on a regular basis, um, saving lives, and it's all because the customs processes were modernized, the rule of law was established, and you know what? We brought innovation there. So you don't need the U.S. leading. There's an example of a fourth world becoming third world country, i.e. Rwanda, saying, you know what? The rule of law works for our economic development, and it can bring a better quality of life to our people. Okay, so well, Laura, let me just take advantage of the fact that you have the microphone. So, okay, so I agree with you about the trade facilitation agreement. That's a, it's an unbelievably important, it's the most important trade agreement most people have never heard of before, but yeah. it's really important. It's about fixing the plumbing at customs and borders is a really critical thing, and it's what's keeping the WTO alive. We've done a number of things here at CSIS about it, so we're very, we're big on the trade facilitation agreement. But, uh, so, but if you had the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Commerce and the National Security Advisor and, and the head of AID in front of you, like if you, in addition to the trade facilitation agreement, what would be two or three other things you would think the U.S. government could or should be doing right now on this issue? Trade facilitation, trade Amen. facilitation, yeah. trade facilitation. Good answer. I, I, I Good think, answer. I think we don't need to dissipate the resources. We need to be singularly focused on that. If you fix the problems at the borders, you can fix a lot of onward okay. issues. Because you know what? Companies aren't going to invest if they can't bring their inputs in and because they're going to be yeah. stuck at the borders. You can't foster economic development if you can't help, um, how should I say, raise the standard okay. of living on the health care side or any number. So it's got to be all through. It's got to be trade facilitation, trade facilitation, trade facilitation. Okay. Are you saying it's trade facilitation? It is trade okay, facilitation. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. So, all right. So let me come back. Okay. So Kendra, can I come back to you? And let me just ask you this question. So if you had the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Commerce, the National Security Advisor, the head of AID, and the person who oversees the World Bank and the MD, other MDBs in a room, and, and they said, okay, what should we do on this issue? Given what you've been doing in your, given your past lives and your current life, what would be a handful of things you would ask, suggest that they do right now? You're saying it's something other than trade facilitation? Yeah. <laughs> and the, well, the answer is trade facilitation, yes. <laughs> And I, I, you know, Laura, I know a lot about the trade facilitation agreement. I'm like really good at a cocktail party about this <laughs> trade facilitation agreement. We've written like six papers on this. And I totally agree with you that it moved, once it was ratified by two thirds of the countries, it moved from being a WTO Geneva thing to a local embassy thing and, 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 and an AID thing and because, a and, and a World Bank thing in terms of saying that we're gonna, we're gonna pay for the technical assistance and fix the plumbing is like someone, the World Bank estimates like 50 million bucks a country to do the fixing. And aid has a, a multi-stakeholder partnership that SIPE runs on this. And so it's moved from a, so you're right, it's implementing the trade facilitation agreement. So I agree with you that it has a lot to do with anti-corruption. So I'm buying what you're selling on that, but I would just say that I'm there are some addition, but and, you're, and, and you're delivering it. And I think, you know, so, so I, I take your point. So, but Kendra, in addition to the trade facilitation agreement. In addition agreement, to the trade and, facilitation. In addition to that. <laughs> Well, I would say uh, for me and for, for the work that we do at the Chamber and our members, I'd say number one is uh, supporting the private sector-led initiatives and collaborations. Um, our Coalition for the Rule of Law and Global Markets is made up of members, and we are about one organization that really focuses on the importance of this issue. And we work closely um, across the government to try and elevate why uh, this is a priority for the American business and why there should be greater collaboration in this space. But we're also involved in the global system. Our members are, are involved in the UN Global Compact and promoting the Business for Rule of Law initiatives. They're involved in promoting within a respective number of uh, initiatives that have been talked about today. And one that I'd like to highlight in particular in which the 
the chamber and our membership has been involved in um, at a regional level has been the America's Business Dialogue. And this is the private sector uh, component to the Summit of the Americas uh, initiative. Uh, first got underway in 2012. Um, most recently, a month ago in Peru for the third CEO Summit of the Americas, uh, the private sectors, not just the United States, but our hemispheric partners around the world, came together and put together an agenda for, for economic growth in the region and across the hemisphere. And one of the key areas, the first recommendation in that initiative, um, in which our U.S. Uh, companies were very actively involved with strengthening transparency and integrity. So recognizing the public-private partnership benefits of collaborating to address these key issues and creating that transparency and accountability, uh, creating the, the predictability of the markets, putting in place the, the systems that allow for due process and for companies to have a mechanism by which they can do business and be good partners um, in, in the system. And so I would say um, on the regional level, on the global level, in our uh, collaborations here domestically, that really focusing on uh, supporting those private sector-led initiatives is a really key signal because uh, as we've talked about, this is something that's very important to the private sector. One of the things that uh, the, the IMF noted about two years ago in a staff note where they looked at corruption is that it cost 2% of GDP globally. That's the cost of corruption. Um, so when you look and take it bigger and, and realize again that corruption is but a symptom of a greater failure of rule of law, it's really important to listen to the private sector and, and the ways in which they can unleash growth through private enterprise. And, and so being supportive and working in lockstep to, to support the environment and the business climate in which companies are operating benefits not just the American businesses that are going overseas, but it benefits uh, all of those global partners who are part of similar initiatives and those private sectors who collaborate. So I'll okay, stop thank there. Thank you very much. So Steve Zimmerman, let me just come back to you. So I know you wear a World Bank hat, but you're also an American citizen. So from where you sit at the World Bank, and if you were thinking about ways in which the United States could make a contribution in this area, given the cards that we've got currently, are there certain things you'd like to see the United States government doing more of in sort of in de in terms of how it engages with developing countries? What would be some of those things? All right, so I'll, I'll dodge the question only in this way. The, I'll make a couple suggestions that I think, not just the U.S. but other large. Uh, the more larger economies, the OECD countries writ large could do. One, I'll pick up on the point that, that Nancy mentioned, but I'll, let me uh, expand on it a little bit. Financial transparency. Um, that is a fundamental key to taking this problem uh, back to the citizens, empowering people in countries to do more about the problem, empowering citizens, empowering the media, um, holding the private sector to account, giving the private sector a vehicle to say no. It's not just about holding them to account. It's putting them in a position to do so. When I say financial transparency, there are, there are two sides of the coin. Sure, there's conflict of interest and there's beneficial ownership, which are the same thing. What conflict of interest is the disclosure of uh, connections by public officials. Beneficial ownership is generally the beneficial ownership of private enterprises. So those are the two sides of the same coin, which are critical. Um, and there is an enormous opportunity to do more in both of those areas. The World Bank just launched its own beneficial ownership policy where it now requires companies, it's a starting point, and we're not as far as we need to go, but it's, we require companies above, who get contracts above a certain, certain threshold to reveal their, uh, their uh, ultimate beneficial ownership. Conflict of interest is an issue that's going before the G20 anti-corruption working group next month. Uh, some high-level principles. High-level principles is always great diplomacy. It's not very pragmatic. The, the key will be taking it down to the next level. So supporting those two initiatives, I think, would be great. Second area would be global cooperation. And there, again, there's sort of two components to that. First is on the, the organizational side, which we touched on, OECD. The OECD Working Group Against Bribery, I think, is the best name and shame group that we have, and the U.S. has and should hopefully continue to play a leadership role, but it's also implementation of UNCAC. It's, it's being involved in- What's that? What's the limitation? Uh, the UN Convention Against Corruption. Uh, in, in very banky academic terms, it's going from the, the de facto to the de jure. It, it's going beyond just the laws, which many countries have. I've been to many countries which have amazing anti-corruption laws. Um, or have constitutions that look very similar to the U.S. Constitution. There's a great Star Trek episode where a country, a world, has adopted the U.S. Constitution yet is completely dysfunctional. So you have to go past the law and go to how it's actually being implemented. The second component of cooperation is on the enforcement side, which is what's near and dear to my, my, my heart, uh, and 
being a facilitator to make sure that there's global cooperation because money knows no borders. And it's not just about prosecuting in the United States. It's about facilitating the return of assets. It's about facilitating um, things beyond criminal prosecutions. It's looking at administrative remedies because in a lot of countries, you're just not going to get a criminal prosecution. Um, and that includes places like France um, where things can be much more challenging to get a criminal prosecution. Uh, and then lastly, the last area I would say is actually go beyond the rule of law. And this goes back to the point I made before, which is work with countries to prepare for that moment when the new president comes to power who's committed to actually fighting corruption and put in place the mechanisms that allow he or she to stay there. Because usually what happens, or often what happens, is they start with the right commitment, but the mechanisms and the framework overtakes things and they're, not, they're left their choices are fairly limited. So I do think that the G7 has the ability to help countries prepare for that moment. Because if you're not prepared for that moment, it's much easier just to slip back to where you were. Okay. Nancy, I know you wanted I wanted to bring you to bring you into this conversation. Well, and in some way just to underscore some of the things Steve said, because he mentioned support for civil society, the media, independent courts. Um, we are living in a moment where the tide is running against and it's one thing for U.S. embassies, I completely agree, to step forward, do all this good work for the private sector, American private sector, to be uh, partnering. But at the end of the day, the work has to be done on the ground by the people who live there, by, covered by the journalists who live there, uh, and so forth. So um, it is it, a lot more attention has to be paid to them and getting resources and political space for them. And in that regard, I would say if I had all those big honchos in front of me, you said, what would I say? I'd say have a consistent public policy position when it comes to autocrats, because we can't be putting our arms around. Uh, some, some and not others. We can't be putting our arms around people who are shutting down civil society, who are killing journalists, who are making it impossible, uh, not only for democracy, but certainly for, for the fight against corruption. So there's a, 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 a you know, inherently conflicting message there that I think we really have to have to look at if we're going to be successful. And just to, to come back to the capacity building, I know we've done it for a long time. I know we need to address culture and values and all of that. Uh, but I can tell you from the people who come through our program, from Africa, from Asia, from every part of the world, um, they, they still need skills. Um, they, they need skills in how do you get evidence from abroad? How do you create incentives so people will blow the whistle? I mean, there's just a lot of information and new generations coming along. Uh, so I, I think we shouldn't just dismiss that as that's, I mean, yes, everything has its limits. We have clearly from this panel a long list of suggestions, um, all, all good. Okay. But just, I just want to underscore something that I think you said at the beginning yeah. is the uh, issue of the progress that's been made, and I think could Definitely. you just could you just spend just another minute on that because I think we had a conversation over lunch about sort of the the trajectory of progress. I mean, we've come a long way from the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Could you just just yeah. reflect on that for a second? Absolutely. I mean, I think we could spend the afternoon talking about a certain kind of progress that we've made. There are over 180 countries who are part, which are parties to the UN, you know, UN Convention Against Corruption. Um, you have all, virtually all the major exporting countries of the world have agreed to prohibit bribery in international business. Um, you've got all the major private sector organizations from the chamber, the international chamber, uh, the World Economic Forum, everybody, all the companies, major companies now uh, committed to compliance. Um, but we are only halfway there, if, if that, uh, if you want to talk about it in those terms. Um, so we need to move, as Steve said, from sort of a, uh, what's committed on paper to actually changing in practice and support people who are moving in that direction. I mean, I think Brazil is a, a bright light for, for all of us. Uh, the Lava Jato case, the prosecutors and judges have come to our law school to, to talk about what they're doing and to learn more because they are in a learning process. Uh, but there are governments who are leaning in uh, doing the right thing, and, and uh, it's a counterpoint to the number of governments going in the wrong direction. I think we need to step back and ask ourselves why we see so many uh, formerly democratic, hard-won democratic countries uh, moving toward illiberal, at best, illiberal democracy. So yes, success, but 
challenges. Okay, so Kendra, and then I want to bring Ambassador Stevenson back in. Thank you. I did want to sort of jump in on, uh, piggyback on the point that Nancy made and Steve just made because I think it's important, um, the point about supporting uh, those who are uh, newly coming into office or newly taking on roles and really um, emphasizing the importance of support for those, uh, those governments and strengthening the rule of law and particularly in applauding the progress and helping them to maintain the progress they're made, they've made. Um, in the areas of international best practices as it relates to the rule of law, due process being one of the key ones, um, but really re with res respect to all of those aspects. And I think that that's a, a really key uh, point that I, d I don't want to get lost in this conversation. I would also just um, echo the point about the importance of civil society. And one of the things that I most appreciate about this panel and one of the things that we try to do with our coalition is make sure that we have not only civil society and government and business all in the same room, but that we're all talking together because I think too often the idea is that you point fingers at one party or another about what they're doing or not doing, when really the solution is in collaboration and really bringing all parties to the table uh, to be able to, to address this issue. Okay, Ambassador Stevenson, so what do you think about this? So I think I heard some great ideas there, and um, I think th we, but the first thing I would do is to say, so replenish those depleted economic sections overseas where there's nobody left to actually do this. When I was a baby officer, I worked on the World Trade Agreement. It was the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. I worked on intellectual property rights. I worked on getting Panama, which is my very first assignment, to actually come into this network of laws. When I went back as ambassador 20 years later, I found my political and economic sections absolutely gutted. The positions had been moved to fill emergency positions in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's time now to move them back and to tell them, first of all, I would have told them, by golly, work on the government procurement process. Use the wonderful example I saw in Panama from the World Bank of Panama Compra, which was an online, speaking of technology, government procurement process. It was transparent. You had to have three competitive bids. It was dead easy for our civil service, uh, civil society partners to read it and track it. And if they were missing it, we would have a lunch with the journalists to say, has anybody gone online lately and looked at this? So it was really easy to use these World Bank tools to actually have this kind of accountability. After today's panel, however, I think I would now make it make sure the trade facilitation agreement has been implemented in your country. And I would work with what Nancy talked about. We have a huge program around the world. It's $100 million. It brings in international visitors so they can learn about the United States. It's been focused on things like climate change and other things which are no longer priorities. Give it a new focus. Tell it to come and meet Nancy and get all trained up on all of these facets. Because this is hard work, actually. You don't just change a culture. You have to put in, there's rules and responsibilities in corporate life. There's a whole series of facets. You have people who have signed open government partnership agreements where they have expressed their intent to take their country from the fourth world to the third world. And they're eager to do it. And we need to be standing there when those moments happen with a whole toolkit available to help them run toward that space. And when they do so, they'll all be better off, their people will be. And frankly, that map's not going to be grayed out for American companies anymore either. So that's what I would do. All right, so there's a lot of smart people <laughs> in this audience that I want to hear from. I want to hear from my friend and colleague, Mark Schneider. I want to hear from Ambassador Jim Michael. I want to hear from John Johnson. So we'll start with my friend, Mark Schneider, over here. He's a, he's a senior advisor here at CSIS. You were head of the Peace Corps. You were assistant administrator for Latin America and the Clinton administration. Un unnecessary. And a friend of many, Thank friend and colleague Thank of many. Um, I, listening to the panel, it's clear that this panel knows a lot about the problems facing us in trying to promote transparency around the world. I would start, I have three comments. One, uh, Steve Zimmerman's point about not taking the lead, U.S. being in the lead. But the, what the U.S. can do is support those countries like Chile and Uruguay, which are listed in everybody's listing of having done the, the hard work to move themselves into good governance, transparency, and in fact, anti-corruption, uh, and to use them. And in fact, CSIS is doing just that in bringing Chile and Uruguay into the Northern Triangle countries but not just government, and here Nancy's point is key. It's not so much knowing what has to be done, but knowing how it has been done. And how it has been done in Chile and Uruguay is bringing 
people from civil society from both left and right, including the private sector, but also including NGOs who are active and getting a consensus that crosses the ideological spectrum. That's what hasn't happened in many countries. You use corruption to go after the other guys. You don't use anti-corruption to recognize you need to strengthen the rule of law in order for the country to progress. That's one. And, and the second point is about borders. You're absolutely right. If Haiti and the Dominican Republic, in fact, strengthened the border, Haiti would, would receive approximately $400 million a year in extra tax revenues if it controlled the contraband that's coming across from the DR. And that's something that hopefully people will take a look at and begin to work. The third question that I have for you, you've talked about what the World Bank does. Uh, Christian Lagarde just gave a speech in which she said that the IMF, as it looked at all new agreements, financing agreements with countries, is going to assess what they're doing with respect to corruption. I'd be interested in your reaction to that. Well, uh, maybe it's all been said, uh, but uh, I, I do think, well, well I'll, I'll say one word about the trade facilitation. I'll say one word about the trade facilitation agreement. I heard when I used to deal with trade issues in state and in USAID uh, that uh, countries were often frustrated because the assistance that w they were being offered by the WTO and others was assistance on how they could comply with the obligations they had undertaken to enter into these agreements that they had been persuaded to enter into. And so who's benefiting from their learning how to comply with their obligations under these agreements? And I can remember a, a trade minister uh, from one of the, the G77 group uh, who said to me, why don't you give us help in learning how we can make money for our businesses and our people by participating in international markets rather than how we can comply with our obligations to you. Uh, the trade facilitation agreement is a great boon, as, as, as Mark just said, for the countries that make it work. You know, what could it do for ha Haiti? What could it do for unblocking the barriers in East Africa among the countries that have all agreed to work together, but there's still you know, getting the, the fresh produce across the line, maybe it'll sit in the sun for a couple of days. So, or not to mention the UPS packages. So I think there's a lot to be said there for that kind of thing, which is responsive to local interests, demand, incentives, values, and politics. And this gets to, to Steve's uh, point. And that is that, and, and, the, and you mentioned earlier when we were talking before this uh, uh, meeting about the world, I guess as mentioned today, was the World Development Report for last year on governance, where it talks about just those things. And what are the factors that influence people's beliefs and their values and their interests and what are the incentives and what are the politics? And those all have to be factored in so that when we do provide technical assistance, for example, we're providing it to somebody who wants to build the infrastructure within their country so that this will be a continuing process. And the people who learn ideas about how to do a better job with some activity of, of, of good governance at home will take that into an environment in which it can have local roots. And it is not something that well, that was a nice program we had in the United States, but it's not relevant here. Or the training program where the enforcement officers go and they learn how to train, how to, how to do these activities right, and then they go back out onto the street or into the customs booth, and all their colleagues tell them, no, you can forget about that. So it needs to have local grounding, and we have to be thinking about what we can do that can help people and governments in the world to do a better job for themselves. Thank you. I want to hear from John Johnson, please. I'm going to have, we're going to do this wave. I want my colleagues to respond to what's been said, and then we're going to have another set of Q&A. Thanks, Dan. Um, one of the things that I really did appreciate that Kendra mentioned. You're with, you're, you're Citibank. I am with Citi. Um, 
We are global bank in 98 countries, including 16 in the grayed out Africa. Uh, so all that to say, I really did appreciate the comments that Kendra made in terms of bringing together all of the different entities that are playing in this space. And certainly, Ambassador Stevenson, your comments on re-energizing the economic sections in particular, um, certainly embassies serve as a great convening factor. Um, as I've listened to all of the comments, and certainly some here from the audience, one of the things that I'm sort of struggling with and how city engages um, in terms of supporting some of these anti-corruption efforts as well as where does the panel think we should focus? Um, certainly there is something to be said for having an enabling environment for, to allow for a lot of the technical assistance and for allow for a lot of the specific endeavors such as the one that Laura mentioned in Rwanda to occur. Um, do we focus? certainly just at the top in terms of those key decision makers, or do we try to look at ways to empower from the bottom up, looking at civil societies, providing specific technical training in schools and what have you, where would you all see the sort of best way to start in addressing this issue throughout the world? Okay, Thanks. I'll start with Steven Zimmer and we'll just go down the, the panel. Go ahead, Steven. Okay, uh, let me comment on a couple of the com questions. The, the, the last question first. Uh, where do you start? Um, I think it is important to focus on each of those different areas. There's a recent report out from the OECD that says I think 55 percent of bribery cases before the OECD implicated the CEO or the senior management of the company. So you can't ignore that. The tone from the top always starts. But, but uh, from our experience, one, middle management, be it middle management in government or middle management in the private sector, is absolutely critical. It may be influenced by the tone of the top, but you need to focus on, the. let's take government, the middle management of government, the people who are executing. However, I would say the most important and perhaps the most forgotten is the, the youngest generation on really beginning to focus on the next generation. It's not that we give up on this one, but we look ahead. There was a great ad that I saw at a, in a in Mexico, you know, that ran before a movie, and it shows a, a father with a young boy driving down the highway, and he stopped for speeding, uh, and the policeman puts out his hand, clearly asking for a bribe, and the father looks at the son, and the son is looking up doughy-eyed at the father, wait to see what the father does, and then, you know, the tagline is, you know, start, you know, teaching your children the right lessons now. So that's absolutely critical. Um, with respect to the question on, or the comment about trust, um, it, that, absolutely right. I mean. Trust, I mean, there's a recent uh, report out by Bertelsmann about how far trust has dropped in all governments around the world, generally. And you're never, we're never going to really make long-term permanent impact until we find a way to begin to restore trust in, in government. We change norms and standards. That links back to education on really beginning to get back to the point where we can educate the younger generation, the people that are coming up, uh, that not engaging in corruption is not just okay, but it's actually the right thing. Last, on the IMF, hey, I'm very much involved in that. I think it's a great thing. I mean, the, the bank is working very closely with the IMF on this. Uh, it has value at a couple of different levels. The first is the diagnostic of how the IMF will decide. They're not going to look at every country. They're going to only look at some. Or they're going to look at every country and then decide which ones require a deeper dive. How they go through that process is critical and an opportunity for us in the international community to reevaluate the kinds of diagnostics that we have to make those distinctions. Second uh, is then how you identify what needs to be done. Uh, because they'll say, country X, you have macro critical corruption, problem. their focus is very much on the macro critical. This is what we recommend. How do you get to those recommendations? It gets back to the whole conversation we've been having is, is, okay, what do you tell a government to do? And when you have the power of the IMF behind that, joining the conversation with the World Bank and with others, hugely powerful. And then third will be the implementation. And there, I think, actually, that's where the World Bank will actually have even a greater role based on our discussions with the fund is then because the fund isn't, isn't as involved in implementation. So this is a great opportunity for the international community, actually, to sort of step up on focus on all the issues that we're talking about here today. I'll start first with the question on uh, where to focus, um, since that was uh, pr uh, particularly focused on, on the comments of the, the power of convening and the opportunities to really sort of dive into to where uh, companies, um, particularly those with great global presence, can demonstrate leadership. And I do think it is uh, uh, beginning at home, so to speak. There's a great formalizing role of the private sector that we haven't really talked about in this conversation. And um, when you have a formal private sector and formal private sector actors, um, they have high compliance standards. So it's 
first uh, leading with those high compliance standards and uh, really being a, a leader in, I hate to use the term trickling down, but really um, uh, imbuing all of those layers within your supply chain of being involved in maintaining and, and also demonstrating those very high standards. Um, it, it's something that helps to reduce the uncertainty. And for a great financial player like Citi, that, that's a great opportunity to, to show leadership um, in how the company operates in, in a market, but also how the suppliers and partners and clients all live up to those principles because you have uh, demonstrated that. And then that gives a greater voice in how you engage with key leaders. So I, I think starting first with, with home, so to speak, in terms of the, the leadership role that you play and, and that very strong uh, reputation that American business takes into markets overseas in terms of how they do business and their compliance standards is a, a certainly a, a first uh, important uh, place to focus uh, before then engaging in some of those other conversations. But I do think it's valuable in utilizing civil society and utilizing government in that conversation uh, and in how you uh, demonstrate that leadership in a market. Um, I also just want to touch on, on uh, the issues around borders and around the, the uh, trade facilitation agreement and and who benefits you're um, in favor of the trade facilitation agreement. <laughs> I was gonna say we're we are in favor of the trade facilitation agreement and I think that the the example that uh, was given in terms of uh, hating the Dominican Republic um, or the East African community or even the countries of CAFTA DR speak to the importance of uh, really having uh, agreements that that have formalizing roles that have clear rules of the road that uh, governments can follow in implementing these agreements that help benefit their own uh, their own uh, private sectors in as much as it does make them attractive to global players including uh, the US private sector so I think that that's a very important uh, conversation to be had and we think that uh, trade agreements and and trade facilitation agreements are very critical in helping to to promote rules of the road that are clear um, and available for all to understand. I'll just make one sort of uh, final note on that uh, in terms of, of why that's important. I talked about the fact that 95% of the world's consumers are outside of the United States. Well, for those US businesses that are looking to go overseas, the majority of them only look at one other market in which to do business because it's very difficult to understand all the different rules of the road, understand all the rules in, in different countries in terms of how do they comply with the rules, how do they meet the, the standards and the requirements. And so there's great benefit to having agreements like a trade facilitation, having uh, a WTO that sets rules of the road that are, are standards that small and medium enterprises can see that there is consistency and how they can engage in those markets across the world. So we definitely think that those are helpful and helpful not just to the U.S. small and medium enterprises as the voice of free enterprise in the United States. It's, I'm obligated to talk about how these things are important for American business, but as we are also very active global players in key global institutions, we know that these are things that benefit small and medium enterprises in other markets, and that's something that we have seen and been consistently part of conversations through um, initiatives like the America's Business Dialogue I mentioned before, we worked with our private sector chamber counterparts and, and business associations across the hemisphere to promote things that would uh, unleash growth and prosperity for those various private sector actors across the, across the hemisphere. Great. Thank you very much. Nancy. Well, they say you should have the same three things and just keep repeating them uh, so people walk away remembering something. But each thing somebody says makes me think of something else. So uh, I'll like just keep, it's a growing list. I'll just, keep, I'll just keep adding to it. I mean, I very much appreciate the question about what can any particular company do. And I think it must be very case specific once you get past make sure your own house is in order. But it does strike me, having worked with the Wolfsburg group of banks, um, that working across an industry sector can be enormously valuable. So um, whether it's reaching out in any particular country to make sure your competitors are doing the same thing you are, uh, or whether it's asking the embassy to reach out to other embassy people. I mean, one of the things we've suggested for a very long time is uh, can the embassy not bring in some of the people from the Japanese, Korean, German, and so forth, uh, to try to help all of the com competitors be on the same on the same page, so I think we could we could explore that a bit more. In terms of the IMF, I'm reminded that it was actually Cam Dassou who said something about the importance of fighting corruption before Jim Wolfenson did, uh, but he 
he didn't get as much credit or any credit. Uh, the, 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 the problem I see, and I think it's great, Steve, that the IMF is doing what it is and that Christine Lagarde is giving it the kind of visibility. Um, for many years, the IMF has done ROSCs, these uh, reports ROSC. on standards and codes where they would assess very important aspects of the way the government functioned. Um, they did a lot on budget transparency, great guidance, and all sorts of good stuff. Where's the implementation? I come back to this halfway across the field and we're not, we're not where we need to be. And part of the problem, I think, is because institutions deal at the federal level with the executive branch. And there are inherent conflicts of interest there. As Steve said, he doesn't get approached by too many governments that, says, that say, tell me where the corruption is. Um, so governments get these assessments and then they don't allow them to be published or they get the assessment and they don't allow anything uh, to happen going forward. So I think we need to think more about working not just at the federal level with the executive branch, but across government more broadly. Uh, and my final point is on trade agreements. Uh, I'm not gonna take issue uh, with the trade facilitation. You're in favor of the trade facilitation agreement. In favor of it, but we've been, I worked on getting anti-corruption provisions into trade agreements for decades. There are anti-corruption commitments that are very important, notice and comment, appeals. It's important for business. It's important for the locals in the countries. And we are throwing out trade agreements. So be aware that when you throw out NAFTA, CAFTA, TPP, you are throwing out anti-corruption. So I come back to let's have a consistent policy. Um, Ambassador Stevenson, are you now or have you ever been in favor of the Trade Facilitation Agreement? Not only am I in favor of the Trade Facilitation Agreement, but Laura has reinforced for me the importance of a single unified message. Absolutely. <laughs> Honestly, what I would do to answer Johan's question here, I would ask for, the, at the federal government level, for us to have a very broad tasking to the embassies, which is improve rule of law, to unleash growth and opportunity in the host nation and at the same time, through the same process, create better, a better climate for American businesses to thrive. You do that, you start, you set the conditions for a virtuous upward cycle. Mm -hmm. Then what do you start on first? This is really what the integrated country strategy by the multi-faceted country team at the embassy in the host country tackles, right? And you sit down with business partners and you sit down with civil society and with journalists and with business leaders as well as government, but it's a much broader set of relationships and you actually do what Alexander Pope said, I'm pretty sure it was Pope, first consult the genius of the place. So you don't do a one-size-fits-all cookie-cutter approach from Washington that you shove out and says, I hope you like it because this is what we're selling. Guess what? They won't. Certainly if you call it corruption, which they're sick of hearing us talk about. However, they like the idea of greater American investment. They like the idea of unlocking growth and opportunity. So there's another way to talk about this, which is much less offensive and opens people up for real partnership. And then there's a series of questions, you know, like what is the most critical impediment to business is coming here. It could be the lack of a trade facilitation agreement. It could very well be. What's low hanging fruit? Which partners are asking you, please help us? So it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that you can step in and grab some stuff now and run with it and then be prepared for some of those ones that we were talking about, Steve, about for next year, for when you get the conditions that you get a new clean government that wants nothing more than to have cleaned up government procurement processes, get everything worked out with your partners, the other countries that are part of this, the World Bank and RUN. But this is the right place to develop the strategy. Very generalized guidance from Washington no 3,000 mile screwdrivers, mm -hmm. and let us actually working with all the stakeholders develop what will work best to help that country go there and also to go there with American businesses being able to be with us. That would be my pitch. So um, my focus would be at the border, and my focus would be on the small and medium-sized enterprises. You're hearing UPS, we're a large company, but you know what? Every package in our cargo hold, every package in our, um, in our trucks, in our trailers, most of them are small and medium-sized companies that are selling products through the e-commerce uh, uh, value chains and or suppliers for bigger companies. And you know what? If you address some of the problems that they face, first and foremost at the border, you unleash a lot of economic 
economic opportunity. Second, you also generate that additional funding that is needed to, to foster further investment in countries um, to promote economic development. The example given about um, just putting a more uh, efficient and uh, corruption-free processes between Haiti and Dominican Republic. You know what, the OECD did a fabulous study on the costs of um, corruption at the borders. It hurts big companies. It adds about a 10% price point to any product you're selling. It hurts the small and medium-sized companies even more. That number goes to 18 to 20%. You want to unlock economic development? You focus on the SMEs, and you make them capable of going global anywhere. And the third comment is related to something that you said, Barbara, you were talking about how the focus now isn't on climate change or on, on women and girls. But I would argue, focus on rule of law and focus on trade facilitation. And I would argue, you're helping foster green. Because you know what? No more paper at the borders. You're not having to do that. It's all electronic. And by the way, you start um, fostering trade facilitation. You know who it helps the most? The small and medium-sized women-owned businesses. Make it easier for them to go global. That she trade initiative, and UPS is 100% behind it, you're starting to help girls and women, because then they have the economic tools to make their own situations better. And that is a powerful tool for economic development. OK, I've got time for two more comments or questions. This gentleman here and this woman here. OK, so this guy, we're going to get a microphone. Yes, I hope you will allow me to sit down. Oh, uh, yeah. I come from Ghana. We are a very democratic yes. government. Uh, I can assure you that uh, the anti-corruption uh, process is very much demanded in Ghana. Every government which has come into power has actually supported the anti-corruption drive. We have even appointed a special prosecutor to prosecute corruption cases. And yet, the feeling in Ghana is that it's going to make very little difference. The real reason is that if you make corruption, or if you define it to basically characterize situations where there is a failure in judgment, or people are caught with their hands in the cookie jar, you limit it to very, very little in terms of what actually affects bad economic outcomes in Ghana. Only the people who are or are stupid enough to take bribes are the ones that are going to be prosecuted by the uh, chief prosecutor or the special prosecutor who has been appointed. And yet, the major problem in Ghana that leads to very negative outcomes, economic outcomes, is the fact that we are dealing with a society which is dominated by cronies. Contract awards are not on the basis of efficiency, are not on the basis of who is the best bidder. It's not even on the basis of who pays the biggest bribes. It's the person who contributed to the political party who won power. And they don't even have to pay a bribe. All they have to do is to express an interest in the contract and so on. You would not expect contract awards to be in a country dominated by uh, oligarchs to be awarded on the basis of efficiency. And therefore, if you're going to do something that may be what you should try to do is to improve the political economic system so that it is a level playing field for everybody. I, I, I absolutely take your point. I think, and I want to hear from this woman over here. But I think so, it's something like 25 or 30 percent of the GNP passes through the hands of public procurement officers in developing countries. So there's all sorts of really important things around public sector procurement that you have to do around this conversation. So I absolutely take your point, and I would hope others will reflect on that as well in their comments. Yes, please. Uh, Christina Pushek from uh, Reason Foundation. Thank you so much for a very engaging panel. Uh, so going back to uh, the case of, um, well, successful cases and how we measure success, is corruption a problem that can be fixed, or is it a recurrent problem triggered by different factors? And how does that impact how we address corruption on the long term. 
Thank you. Okay. So I'd love to hear comments from the panelists about any of the two comments that were just made. Did you want the gentleman in the green? You know, we're running out of time. Okay. So, Stephen. Yeah. Well, first, I feel badly I'm the only person who hasn't worked trade facilitation agreement into my answers. But um, thank you for doing it. <laughs> I, I have learned now. I will certainly go back and read about it. Um, from our, our colleague from Ghana, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I don't have a perfect answer, but you're right. And I tried to stress that in some of my earlier comments. It is about the politics. Uh, we cannot prosecute our way out of this problem. I guess this really ties to both of the comments. Can corruption be fixed? Um, I don't think that's the right question. Uh, you know, to, to wear my lawyerly hat. It's like, how do we do better? Uh, will we eliminate corruption? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, I'm probably not. So the question is, how do you mitigate the impact of corruption in a country like Ghana, uh, which is truly a, a leader in Africa and still has this significant corruption problem? And how do you deal with the issue of corruption among the G7? I mean, so it, it's different answer, different similar solutions to yeah. different problems. So you really can't fix it. Okay, so Kendra. Yeah. I'll just quickly also jump on the how to, can corruption be fixed? Um, for us, the reason that we focus on the rule of law and we look at the rule of law as our framework for, for entering into this conversation is because by strengthening institutions and by introducing transparency, accountability, predictability, stability, and due process to the systems and supporting efforts of governments to do those things, that it can help uh, shrink the occurrence of, of corruption. And so that's a real key focus for our work. Nancy? Yeah, I, I think the, the situation you point out is, is where the law and reality bump into each other. Uh, I don't think it's unique to Ghana. I think we've had our own issues here in this country with pay to play, uh, with contracting awards to political contributors. Um, I was I'm reminded uh, a recent op-ed that was in the paper, sleazy, swampy, but legal, um, talking about our political <coughs> Uh, our lobbying system right now, which allows people to pay an awful lot of money to gain access, and how the courts have made it more and more difficult to prove bribery or anything else untoward actually occurred. Uh, I mean, the Supreme Court itself said acts that Governor McDonald did were tawdry, but don't rise to the level for a conviction for bribery. That, that just makes our job that much more difficult. So I think that the two answers do go together. Um, Kendra's, Kendra's comment, you need to change the way procurement is done to make it more transparent. Um, you need to enforce the law so that if someone is found to be awarding a contract in a way that's illicit, you know, you need to track the money and so forth. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a recurrent problem that is not going to go away. Uh, and we simply have to keep redo redoubling our efforts and keep refining our laws and practices to try to, uh, to try to address it. Okay, Ambassador. I do agree that um, you can't prosecute your way out of this. It's particularly because in the places where these problems are most acute, the, probably the weakest tool that you have in your toolkit is a, is a judicial system. It's not fair. So actually trying to start with that almost guarantees failure. So it just, it, we, I've seen us be frustrated with, by this, with, for, with this with dec for decades. I actually think I might want to put forward the argument that what you measure is um, growth and prosperity. Do you have the ability for middle class to emerge? That's what I've seen over the course of my 30 years working with Latin America. There wasn't really much of a middle class when I started, and there sure is one today. And it makes a hell of a difference for all those moms who've got a light bulb and a microwave and the ability to help their kids do their homework instead of wandering around trying to find firewood so they can cook and give their kids, you know, asthma. So it's transformed lives. It's transformed lives here. So I think that the perfect can absolutely be the enemy of the good. I mean, you want, that's why I never talk about eliminating corruption. I talk about growing the space for a more positive kind of activity to emerge. <laughs> it is an ecosystem. It does crowd it out. I could have a long conversation about what I found in Panama with the banking system during my first tour as a junior economic officer and what had happened through the work of the Financial Action Task Force by the time I went back there as ambassador utterly transform and do not confuse beneficial owners and bearer shares with the banking system it's a lawyer's issue but the part that was with the banks was fixed so it does get fixed and as it does it's transformed lives
spots. Panama has a robust middle class. I watch goods come in and I watch people actually be able to do them and spend lives in, in an entirely different way than they had 30 years ago. I think that's what success looks like. Okay, Laura. So um, just to pick up on uh, the words of our founder, we do the right thing whether we get the business or not. And so in the case of Ghana, all I'd say is um, whether there's still challenges in Ghana, the country needs to keep doing the right thing because you will get credit for it. And on that point, I'm uh, the vice chairman of the President's Advisory Council for doing business in Africa, one of the four countries that Secretary Ross um, and members of our council are visiting is Ghana. Why? Because because it is recognized as having taken all those steps to try to do the right thing. And maybe in that context, U.S. business can be partnering with those that are outside of that party cronyism and really advance um, the prospects for true economic development. So kudos to Ghana for taking those steps. And we'll try to um, show that there's value in having taken those steps. With respect to um, the question of, are you ever going to get rid of corruption? Um, Probably not, but I would argue that technology can play a very important role in terms of taking the opportunities out of the equation, uh, focusing back on the borders, bring technology to the borders, and then you don't have to worry about some of that corruption happening because the bit streams, like I said, don't ask for bribes. So make it harder to do, and you create more um, uh, processes that level a playing field and uh, play to fair actors. Okay, please join me in thanking the panel. This was great.